Welcome to 21st Century Radio. I'm Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. Laura Kortner is our executive producer and Anita Brockington, our engineer. Joining us this portion of our program is Meg daly Omart. She is author of Made for Each Other, The Biology of the Human-Animal Bond, a DeCapo Press 2009 release. For anyone listening who loves a dog or has loved a dog or a cat, your perspective, like Meg's and mine, will probably be the same we've discovered, that these meaningful, loving relationships deepen our lives and open our hearts. She has found this to be true to such an extent that the program she's founded makes a special effort at uniting dogs with veterans of war through her program, The Warrior Canine Connection. You can find it at www.warriorcanineconnection.org, and that's some of what we'll discuss this hour. Thank you so much for joining us, Meg. Thank you, Zoe. It's great to be here. Well, I also want to mention it was Dr. Sue Carter of the University of Illinois who told us about your work, and Dr. Bob interviewed her with a focus on oxytocin and social bonding. So let's start with that beautiful oxytocin in dogs. What do the two have to do with each other? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, um, that's how I met Sue 19 years ago. I realize now it's kind of a gulp. Um, I had read an article in the New York Times that she was interviewed in uh, when they had just discovered that oxytocin was more than the neurochemical that releases breast milk and labor contractions. And I had been working on developing a series on the biology of the human-animal bond, and uh, I'm sorry, on the history of the human-animal bond, and, and I had been interviewing some of the early pioneers of animal-assisted therapy. And what they were telling me about how uh, bringing uh, children with ADHD and behavior disorders and psychiatric other psychiatric disorders together with um, animals lowered their heart rate and blood pressure and all these anti-stress and pro-social effects that they were seeing. And then the next day, uh, and I asked them, I said, well, tell me something. You know, you're, you're actually getting physiological changes because they said lowering heart rate, lowering blood pressure. I said, what's the biological mechanism? And no one had asked that question, amazingly enough, 19 years ago. Well, the next day I picked up the New York Times and I read this article about oxytocin that mentioned Sue Carter. And I'm in Washington, D.C., and Sue was down the road in College Park, Maryland, at the University of Maryland. And the effects that they were getting, uh, she, with her prairie voles and uh, other colleagues working with women with uh, who were breastfeeding were the exact same effects that these other researchers were getting when you put people together with pets. And I looked at the two results and the, the New York Times article and the notes I had taken the day before, and, and I just said, that looks exactly the same. So I called Sue and I said, uh, Dr. Carter, uh, I'm developing a, a television series, and I'd like to know, I, you know, I talked to this, this psychiatrist, he says this, you say that. Does that mean oxytocin is the biological basis of the human-animal bond and also responsible for the therapeutic effects that these other researchers are getting? And she said nothing for <laughs> several <laughs> seconds. And then she said, yes. And I said, oh, great. Who do I interview? You know, I'd like to follow up on that. And she said, nobody. Would you like a Ph.D.? <laughs> So I know, and I went, well, I have a deadline on Thursday, so that's not going to be in the cards. But, you know, it, it was a big surprise mm -hmm. to me that um, when I first asked the the one researcher in the human-animal bond field, well, what's the biological mechanism? And nobody had ever even thought about that. Right. That he actually said unconditional love. And I said, no, 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 I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a biological effect. Something has to be causing it. So that got me introduced to Sue, and she was very intrigued that I would make that connection, which I'm sure to you now sounds about completely logical. It didn't seem like a giant leap at all to me, right? but apparently it was. And so she invited me to come out to her laboratory at the University of Maryland, and I did. And she just said, you know, I can't get over the way you think. I'd really like to work with you. <laughs> so we kind of developed this um, partnership then, and she introduced me to all the oxytocin people, and 
said, Meg has this very interesting idea. Well, you know, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. Well, I was going to say that the beautiful thing about this research and the recognition of it is that in your work, though, you take it way back to the Ice Age and this oxytocin... um, reflex, I shouldn't say it reflex, response to bonding with animals and caring for animals was really not just um, a phenomena that was happenstance. It also had a great deal to do with survival. So talk to us a little bit about this relationship between the wolf and humans and, and why the oxytocin component that is really a very pleasurable reality for the human is also a mind expanding and heart expanding, um, I guess, reflex as a result of this. Well, one of the things that caught my attention was that this is an ancient mammalian hormone. All mammals make it. And uh, it's ancient. And so it's been at work causing um, all sorts of um, social behavior in all mammals and, and, and reproductive behavior that has proven to be very adaptive and, and critical to the survival of all mammalian species. Um, when one of the researchers, Sherston of Dismoberg, told me that pe- stroking a rat 40 times in a minute for five minutes releases oxytocin in the rat, I said, well, that's human to animal. What about animal to human? And that study had not been done. But it made me think, well, this is a very permeable system. It goes across species barriers. And it made perfect sense that then some, you know, that just when you have something that can um, cause anti-stress and pro-social effects, you're basically talking about a system that is powerful enough to turn off fight-flight. And fight-flight is the essence of a wild animal. All of us, we are like wild animals. We fight or we flee. It's antisocial. And if you can suppress that, what you get is a calm connect response that overpowers it and causes domestication, social behavior, cooperation, trust. Those are the basic things of domestication. So I realized that not only was oxytocin at the basis of all of our interpersonal relationships with each other and with our babies and, and with our pets, that it had to lie at the heart of domestication as well, and because domestication is a triumph of trust over paranoia. So uh, when I started really thinking then, okay, if I can't track this back a million years, and see how it could unfold throughout that time period, then there's something wrong with the hypothesis. But it did. It tracked perfectly through it. And what you see is that just selecting for personality qualities like tameness, which is trust and anti-aggression, will turn a wild animal into a domesticated animal And in the case of wild foxes, where a study was done, in just five generations, they could take a wild fox, they could take wild foxes, select only for tameness, that's the only quality that they looked at, and they got basically a dog in in a very short period of time. Which would explain how, if we started allowing the tamest wolves to hang close to us, and it would have only been the tamest that self-selected them, you know, right, to be, to be there. Us. Sure. There, and there may have been a lot more of them. I mean, when we think about wolves today, we are thinking about the paranoid subset that has are the only ones that have survived the onslaught of of a genocide that we did to them. But back in the day, in the Ice Age, there may have been lots more that were less paranoid and wanted to hang around human camps. And once some of our ancestors who noticed that these animals were not particularly aggressive, they may have started to build a detente back and forth with the, with the ones that were tamest. Those ones that are tamest have tamer puppies. That's what we know. Um, and once we started bringing them into our caves or our campsites, those puppies, if their mothers were not with them, 
would have cried, and any woman who would have been nursing would have picked that baby up and held it to her breast just like she would her own because those cries would have released the breast milk in the Ice Age woman and made her want to connect and want to nurture and take care of this baby animal. It happens all the time, even today, in primitive societies. That's how they care for young, domesticated animals that they keep in the villages. There is no 7-Eleven. There is no puppy chow. And once that happened, you unleash this powerful chemical that changes the way you feel about something, changes the way you see it. Oxytocin causes us to have something called social recognition. It's why a mother looks at a baby and says, that's mine, I will protect it, I will feed it. And we do it with, when oxytocin is released from a triggering with an animal, we see it as our own. It's why we call our dogs and our cats and our pets our babies, our family. It's, that's not crazy. That is biologically by the book. And it's running on the same brain chemistry that makes a mother see a baby as her own and bond to it and decide to care for it and feed it and nurture it. And it's interesting that in the current day and age with all the rescue circles because of so much overbreeding, I mean, two million some dogs are put to sleep a year because there's just so much reckless breeding. And and when we look at the difference between where we were as a humanity when we were very connected to nature versus where we are as a humanity today, very divorced from nature, kind of abusive to nature, not kind of, but deliberately abusive to nature. How, how does oxytocin play a role in that? I mean, are we so moving away from having the ability to feel that even that hormone isn't something many people can experience all the time? Well, if you follow the hypothesis that being... Um, involved with nature, living with animals, caring for them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which is what our agricultural, agricultural society for 10,000 year, years was. Mm -hmm. And before that, for a million years, we stared at them every second of the day for dear life. Mm -hmm. And we studied their behavior. They were the most interesting thing on the landscape. They had to be. And now we know just eye contact will release oxytocin. So... Animals were completely ingrained in our daily lives, in our retinas, as we saw from cave paintings. We could go into these dark caves and perfectly reproduce them, and into our consciousness. Um, we, when, when language, when art started to appear, when we started to express ourselves, we painted 45 million animals on every surface we could find. Um, when language started to manifest metaphors, had animals, you know, lazy pig, uh, uh, you know, uh, fat pig, uh, lazy sloth, uh, strong as a bull. We almost couldn't learn language if we didn't have animals. Well, then, in just the past hundred years, we have walked away from this very ancient bond that didn't just have an emotional component for us, but actually help to shape our central nervous system because oxytocin is absolutely um, central to how, our, uh, how we react to stress and in uh, tamping down, as I said, fight flight mm -hmm. and, and, and causing um, a greater propensity for trust and cooperation. It has this powerful cardias, cardiovascular uh, protection element to it as well. So what do you see today? You see a very divorced society from nature. You see splintering within the family group. Technology has allowed us to just completely not just leave the farm, but leave the community. Um, we are, our, most of our contact now is virtual. And what do you see? You see a rise in cardiovascular disease, stroke, and mental illness, which are all indications that we are suffering from oxytocin deprivation. It's just fascinating. We, you know, we, we have to take a little break, but when we come back, I want to come back to that because this oxytocin deprivation, you also talked about this relationship to the animal kingdom, to nature itself, that there's something called mirror neurons, and, and they 
have a, a role to play as well. So when we come back, we'll pick it back up. Our guest is Meg Daly Omart. I want to also leave a lot of time for talking about your Warrior Canine Connection. You can learn more at her website, warriorcanineconnection.org. And the book we're discussing, it's just beautiful. I mean, I, I, if you all want to read something that will give you the whole history of humanity with the animal kingdom, particularly the dog and the domesticated animal, this is the book, Made for Each Other, The Biology of the Human-Animal Bond. Hello, my name is Matthew Fox, and I'm a spiritual theologian, author of a number of books, including Christian Mystics and The Pope's War. And you are listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zoe, and I commend Dr. Zoe for her wonderful work and for having a program that offers alternative ways of seeing the world and seeing it through the glasses of spirituality and ethics. So stay listening. Thank you, Dr. Fox. What a beautiful writer. What a wonderful theologian. Meg Daly Omar joins us currently. Her book, Made for Each Other, The Biology of the Human-Animal Bond, a DeCapo Press 2010 release. And there's a link right on the front of our page, 21stCenturyRadio.com. But you all, also we're going to talk about the warrior canine connection. All right, so oxytocin and our deprivation or our loss of it, particularly through the medicalization of childbirth. So let's talk about that because I think that that has is so much to do with the destruction of the world. I know to some people that sounds so ridiculous, but that's what I actually think. Well, that's Sue Carter's uh, area, too. Um, it was She was the person who, who really, um, and, and uh, Shishan of this Moberg, who, who opened my eyes to the, what happens when women have, for instance, elective... Um, uh, C-sections. Not we're not talking about emergency C-sections, but um, which may be being done uh, more often than is necessary. Uh, but elective C-sections, so that you can know exactly what day your baby's coming and you can be back to work or or not have it mess up your vacation, something like that. Women need to know that the studies show that uh, they will have a less powerful um, and robust system of oxytocin release if they avoid vaginal delivery, which naturally primes the system and gets it going. Um, and we just don't know what that really does at the end of the day. We do it, what we know is that, they, a lot, that it can uh, interfere with breast milk um, ejection and production, um, and all of those things really do affect bonding with your baby. Now, more studies need to be done. Pitocin is used regularly. We give women oxytocin to speed uh, delivery along because we're on the clock now with, with uh, managed health care, if, if you have it. And, um, you know, it, it, this is an incredibly powerful, incredibly ancient, probably the most important chemical that social mammals make in their brains. And we're messing around with it without understanding it well. And that's very dangerous during that critical window of development uh, uh, for a baby's brain and for the development of the bond between mother and child. Um, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't mean to not answer your question earlier about, you know, all the dogs that are in uh, abandoned. And, you know, when you consider that oxytocin increases our ability for social recognition to see other as kin, which is basically what it is, mm -hmm. if, you, if you're low in oxytocin, it allows you to be incredibly careless with all your social relationships. And we also have, um, you know, our, these modern brains have the, our frontal lobes, our talking brain that talks us out of a lot of very important um, natural wisdom. And so that's the modern dilemma is that you have these very um, powerful brains, um, but you know, we're, we often forget the wisdom part of it and, and ignore the very ancient non-conscious intelligence, and, uh, which would tell you that just doing what, you do to nat what we're doing to nature is not adaptive, it will not hold, and, um, you know, that, that are the greatest biological adaptation that, that we humans ever did 
was to come together uh, and cooperate and build societies and with animals and with other humans. And if we decide that we're going to um, eliminate the brain chemistry that supported that, um, we're, we're headed for big trouble. Humans that don't attach die. That's what happens. Social mammals must be together. What's so interesting, because you commented, and and we've talked about it on other portions of our program, of how often the human is overpowered by this fight-or-flight syndrome. And particularly the media emphasizes it. War is a reality. Human trafficking is a reality. I mean, there's some really horrible realities on the planet because of this callous um, perversity which has nothing to do with benefiting anybody other than somebody gaining by exploiting some system, whether it's natural or otherwise. So when you looked, you there was something in your work that struck me about these uh, mirroring neurons. Can you explain what that is and why that's important? They were only, dis- mirror neurons were only discovered a short time ago by some Italian researchers. And they are very ancient Um, again, uh, brain uh, nerves uh, that allow us, when we see an action, we mirror it in our brains. The the, the action actually happens in us as well. So if, if, um, if you see somebody eating an ice cream cone. That's what this one monkey, he had his, he had electrodes on his, on his brain. They were studying something totally different. And he saw one of the people in the lab eating an ice cream cone and the electrodes in his brains went off indicating that he was lifting his arm to his, to his face. And he wasn't, he was just watching somebody else do it. So what that says is that to see action, your body starts to set it up in tiny micro electrical pulses. You start to enervate the, uh, to, to energize the, the uh, nerves and the muscles that you would use if you were making that action. Mm-hmm. It's why when you're watching like a tennis match, you know, you can barely sit still in, in, in your seat because right. you're going back and forth or any sport like that. And um, what it real, but the amazing thing is, is it means that when somebody else is experiencing something, we are experiencing it. Those who are watching it closely are experiencing it as well. It is the basis of making other self and and empathy. Mm-hmm, and you, I feel your pain. Mm-hmm. I actually feel your pain right. because when I see you wince, the mirror neurons reflect it in my brain, and I experience a version of it. And, well, and this is, I'd, I'd like to add, this is one of the reasons I encourage people not to watch the news. And particularly when the news goes piranha tank, where they repeat the same story, the worse the better for them, over and over and over again. And I remember after 9-11, we had months and months of destruction going through our nervous system and our physiology. And the response was more fear, more shutting down, and more interference by government in places it had no business being. So so that this is a really huge reality, this mirror neuroning that, that, that it's not mirror neuroning. I've coined a new term. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> but but it has also something to do then. I'd like to sort of parlay this to to the work you do with the warrior canine connection because men and women who have been to war, their bodies have literally been to war and their entire physiology and and psychology and nervous system have been tampered with. So let's talk about then why this and working with dogs and the collaboration between warriors and dogs is so successful and so vital? Well, the warriors uh, that I am working with at the National Intrepid Center of Excellence, and I and let me just say, it is not my program per se. I am a, a, honored to be part of it. The Rick Yant, who is a social worker and professional service dog trainer, was the genius behind it. He was the one who worked with children, neglected children in foster care, neglected and abused, and saw how his puppy, his pet dog, he had a golden retriever, 
um, was able to calm children even when they, on their worst day of their lives, when they were being forcibly removed from a biological parent to be sent into emergency foster care. I think we can all just take a mirror neuron moment there and mm-hmm. say, that's the worst. And um, he saw how this puppy cut through that trauma and, and, and brought peace and a smile to the child's face. And he said, that's it. I'm never leaving this dog home. I must incorporate it in my work. And he started, this was many years ago. And when uh, soldiers started coming home from Iraq and, and, and post-traumatic stress disorder, remember, that wasn't even a term that had been used in Vietnam. That's post-Vietnam that we've come up with this terminology. And he was hearing a lot about it, and he recognized that it was very similar to what he had seen in the children that he had worked with in foster care. And he said, I wonder if, it would, if, if working with the dogs would help them. The military has a long relationship with dogs, the dogs of war, uh, sniffing, bomb-sniffing dogs, um, messaging dogs, um, uh, attack dogs. Um, they, they love their dogs. They, they, dogs have gone to war with, with soldiers and given uh, cr- cr- fantastic stories of bonding and, and, and heroism. And, um, and so there is this tradition, so we're lucky to be able to draw on that. But even stronger than that is the tradition of the warrior ethos, which is that these are mostly men that we work with. And I think we all know that it's very difficult to get a man to take care of himself. And to ask a Marine to take care of themselves is even harder. But they will do something for another soldier in need or a veteran in need. And so what we say is, would you like to help train this service dog while you're being treated for PTSD? This is in a hospital setting. And they say yes. And in the training of the dog, that very high quality attention and nurturing, and it's all very positive, the, the, the methods that we use, releases the oxytocin in them and reboots the brain system that has been shut down by boot camp and by war and oftentimes, um, you know, explosives that, you know, they've experienced concussion many times from IEDs. So they have traumatic brain injury as well. They are stuck in fight flight. When you think about it, the creation of a warrior is somebody that you, you, you take out of the ComConnect system. You put them on high alert. You tell them the only people that they should trust and approach are the ones wearing the uniform, the same uniform. So there's your social recognition being subverted for this warrior reason. They go out, repeated deployment, repeated deployment. This is what the nature of these this 10 years of war has been. And then you bring them back and you say, okay, you know, go to the mall. It's, 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 it's not, it doesn't work. No, of course not. So what we are doing through asking them to train a service dog, and these are fabulous young dogs. We breed them, you know, they're Labradors and they're, they're gold retrievers, and they're bred for the work because our they're going to be mostly mobility uh, assistance dogs, and they have to be so attached to humans, so focused on humans that they it can be done completely by voice command because we're working with amputees or people who are, have spinal cord injuries and may not. They have to. This dog has to be absolutely willing and dedicated to the work. And those breeds lend themselves to it. So we breed for that temperament. We breed for health. And when you see these guys working with the dogs, it's fabulous. Uh, the, you know, one of the main uh, symptoms of PTSD is just dulled affect. They, have, they don't show emotion. And they have to to get the dog to work. They have to say, good dog. You know, they have to sound happy. They have to do things they would not normally do. And or or they would not, that their PTSD is is suppressing in them, and we then take instead of having them having this repeated bad exposure to their thoughts or to um, in the case of going to war the you know 
to, every day to, to, to be under fire and not know who's going to be blowing themselves up next to you. We have them have wonderful, positive uh, interactions with the dogs, but not just the dogs, the people that come up to them, because these dogs attract everybody. Can I pet your dog? Can I pet your dog? Can I pet your dog? That's a beautiful dog. All the people want to do is talk about the dog. And so they have what they discover is that stranger is in danger, which is what it was like when they were over in Iraq or Afghanistan. Now they go out to the mall and they're teaching the dog how to go up and down the escalator, how to open the door for them to the store. And, and people are coming up to talk to them. And instead of recoiling, what they're finding is they see the, the person is, it wants to talk about the dog and it, and, it, and it's easy for them. It gives them something to talk about. And the more positive experiences they have, the more the oxytocin system gets rebooted. You know, it's like just it just starts to cut through. And it's amazing the effects that we see. Um, there's the dogs sleeping through the night with the dogs. These are, these are some of these men have not slept in years more than two, zero to two hours a night, sometimes no more than eight hours in an entire week. And, and then they have eight hours sleep with the dog and no meds. Um, and I think we know that sleep is the most important thing for all of our um, mental and physical well-being. And so our hope is that um, by increasing their ability to sleep, by rebooting their oxytocin system, that the brain will start to regenerate some of the nerves that are so damaged, find other pathways around them, and, uh, and, and reignite the system that has been shut down um, and must be rebooted or they will not be able to be social mammals and exist in society. And and what's so beautiful in reading all the literature about the warrior canine connection is that it serves these four vital military missions. And you said that in this way, the men returning become part of others helping other wounded fellow warriors. It's a safe non-pharmaceutical therapeutic for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. And it ends up really bringing people back into a sense of feeling. You know, one of the problems for our whole society, not just for soldiers, is the armoring, the actual physical armoring we do to survive the noise, the supposed danger in some places supposed in other places very real depending on where you are and the sense of lack of connectivity to the all of the you you know that it's not an us it's just the other and the other isn't necessarily somebody we want to know so it's not just the soldiers who are suffering in this way well it's always been a dangerous world i mean you know <laughs> i mean it wasn't any fun in the ice age too but we had each other and and mm-hmm. we had Um, these things that brought back a homeostatic balance now are, you know, we we live surrounded by millions and touched by none. Mm -hmm. This is the amazing thing. We are surrounded by people, and so many people are living in utter isolation. True. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really not adaptive. And, and then you have virtual reality and virtual contact, which is even worse. Well, you know, I, I don't know because the studies haven't been done. It's very interesting. We are going to be looking at it um, at the National Intrepid Center where we offer the program. They're, they want to do um, a virtual reality um, uh, ex- uh, with the dogs, mm-hmm. uh, teaching dog training through virtual reality. You do have people who who are doing studies of, you know, how how good are robotic dogs versus real dogs. And the, the point is, I, you know, like it's like stuffed animals. They'll they they'll be good, you know. They're good to a degree, but there's nothing like the feedback the the dogs provide biofeedback instantly. Exactly, and and everybody in our audience knows I am the dog lady. So we'll be right back for more with another dog lady. This is great. Warrior Canine Connection. You can find more online about that. We'll be right back with our guest Meg Olmart. This is Eric Herm, farmer and author of Surviving Ourselves, 
You're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. Stay tuned. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. Meg Daly Omar joins us. Her book, Made for Each Other, The Biology of the Human-Animal Bond, a DeCapo Press 2010 release. And you can also get a link right on the front page of 21st21stcenturyradio.com. Right now we're talking about Meg's involvement with the Warrior Canine Connection. You can find them online, triple w dot warriorcanineconnection.org. So when you look at all of these soldiers working with these dogs, firstly, how many people are involved and how many dogs are trained? Well, we are just a a new organization, um, Warrior Canine Connection, um, and at the present time, uh, about 85 warriors have worked with the dogs. It takes two years to train a young dog Mm -hmm. through the whole process and for the dog to mature. I mean, they need to sure. be strong. They need to be. They need to be emotionally sound. Uh, we have to evaluate. We won't know if their hips are good, if their um, if their hearts pass the test, if their eyes are good. So, in that two year process, um, in the medical treatment program that we are offering at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, where the uh, National Intrepid Center is that we work uh, in Bethesda, um, the up to 20 uh, different service members who come from all over the country. Uh, these are service members who have, p- have been diagnosed with PTSD and or other psychological injuries and have not responded to treatment thus far. And so they come to this incredible place that has the state-of-the-art diagnostic and treatment uh, center uh, at uh, Walter Reed, as I said, mm-hmm. in this Special place. But, but what you all and, are really showing is something that, as your book so details, is that our relationship with animals has been an important part of humanity's well-being and capacity to develop compassion and bonding. So for anybody yeah. in the listening audience who knows somebody with children who are high-stress handlers, you know, that they just don't ever seem to be able to calm down in their life or their body, having a dog can make a profound difference. If they are guided carefully with the dog. I, I mm-hmm. completely agree. There's, there's play therapy. There's a wonderful play therapist named Risa Van Fleet, who I would recommend to any parent, uh, who works, shows children how to play with dogs. You know, we've, we've really lost our instincts on how to be around animals. And that's why I love this program teaches these uh, service members how to behave with dogs. People think they know. They do. They, th- they also think they know how to raise children, and most of them are doing a pretty lousy job of it. Um, and so it, if you can really guide somebody and show them, no, no, you know, t- you, you, the positive way, the, the depth of communication that's possible, um, the best way to achieve it, um, communicating with an animal can be the most powerful releaser of oxytocin because animals, even though, you know, people say, oh, they have unconditional love. It is not unconditional. It's highly conditioned. You cannot treat an animal badly and expect them to bond or even not bite you, for that matter. You're not going to get the quality of the uh, interaction, the bond, or the, the oxytocin reward for you unless you approach the animal in the best, most respectful and interested way. Children are not interested in boring people that don't pay attention to them. Animals are not interested in boring people that don't take the time to see how they see the world and approach them on that level. That's what we teach. And and what's very beautiful about our program is not only does it make um, the uh, service members that are being treated feel better, better. I mean, physically feel better. Their heart rate comes down. We do heart rate variability measures, and they respond to stress so much better around the dogs. Like I said, they sleep better through the night. They learn to control their emotions, which is very difficult for them. Um, Anger issues are very prominent, and they become better parents. We have so many service members who say, now I know how to talk to my three-year-old. Mm-hmm. My, my marriage was about to break up. My wife was going to leave me because she could not stand the way I was interacting with our child. Well, when you take service members like that 
and they and they're, they're they have PTSD, which does not make for a great personality. Um, and it breaks up marriages, and then you lose the human social support, and you start on a spiral down the toilet. And that's why we have so much suicide. These are people who are they 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 have shunned and driven away everybody in their lives. And what they're left with are their horrible memories, way too many drugs for the most oftentimes, because don't forget they're also in a lot of pain physically. Mm -hmm. A lot of them have terrible physical um, injuries. And so they're on pain medicine and they're on antipsychotics and they're on antidepressants. And it's a very dangerous situation. So if we can approach them in a non-pharmaceutical way, way and regenerate this system, we are really providing a service that is, is a must. And we are going to do the scientific studies that will take it out of the anecdotal realm and quantify it and qualify it with, with, by measuring actigraphy sleep that actually measures the amount of sleep they're getting, heart rate variability, which is an indication of how the central nervous system is responding. Um, and I would, and, and I'm hoping to do oxytocin studies eventually. Um, that's in the works to show that actually, you know, there, there have been five studies now that show that human human dog interaction raises oxytocin in humans, and several of them have shown it also raises it in the dog when it's a positive and friendly interaction. So we know that it's happening, but to show it in this population will blow open the doors of the military and, and, and VA hospitals so that they, they will see this is a, an evidence-based therapy. Well, you know, and, and on another level, it's so important, you know, to think that this bond with the wolf came as a result of the Ice Age. And when I think about it's, it's a kind of peculiar paradox as we move into global warming, which might be before a mini ice age. It's interesting to see how many rescue circles there are. I'm, I'm a member of many of them, which is how I've gotten all my dogs. And when I look at the women, it's primarily women who yes, are... Well, how about that? That's yeah, exactly. Who are caretaking <laughs> these millions of dogs, creating literally, you know, carpool tag teams to drive them from state to it's state. It's so like, true. It's so true. Do you know, um, oh, what's her name who did you had me at Wolf. That book, it, you have to interview that woman. She is a riot. She's so funny, and and she talks about that. It's That's a great book. Well, it's what it what it says to me is that it's kind of like where the world is. The women are rising, and the women are going to pick up the pieces and try to put it back together again. We so, hope. Well, God willing, <laughs> and with all our great we efforts, hope we are. hope exactly. But I wondered, you know, when if oxytocin has this capacity to create such an amazing ability to feel and to, and and this compassionate bonding that occurs with what you look at, that why can't we give men oxytocin? Well, I don't know whether Sue talked about this. I, I wasn't it, here that evening. There is no oxytocin drug. Oh, <laughs> I guess someone's going to work on that. <laughs> well, oh, they're all working on it like crazy. Let mm-hmm. me tell you. Well, Pitocin is synthetic oxytocin, and mm-hmm. you give it to women when they go into labor, right. and, it, and it's, uh, you know, speed brings it on up. their labor contractions right. and keeps 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 everybody on the conveyor belt mm-hmm. moving right through. Mm-hmm. Well, that we know that that works on the, the oxytocin receptors in the uterus and in the breast. Well, to get oxytocin through the blood-brain barrier is very, very difficult. You would have to give massive intravenous doses. Um, there is oxytocin inhalant, and probably many of the people in your audience have either seen the liquid oxytocin, liquid trust, I think it's called on the Internet, that's probably absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's not even pharmaceutical So get a dog. Rescue a dog. That's that's going to be my new thing. That's the safest, most natural. (laughs) Can I just say, women, don't be taking oxytocin. We've already done hormone replacement therapy. It wasn't a good idea at the time. It isn't. Get a dog. Take a a nice warm bath. um, Have sex. Hug somebody. Eat all chocolate. Of these things, <laughs> eat fatty foods. All of these things release oxytocin naturally. Mm-hmm. Well, I must be an oxytocin junkie because I've only spent a few years of my entire lifetime without dogs. And they were definitely my crazy years. I mean, I have Well, you always... know what I say is, is we got rid of the sheep, but we had the good brains to keep the shepherd. <laughs> I think all of our, our... We have invested 
all of our um, uh, animal-centric uh, uh, biophilia tendencies, all of our love for nature is now um, being uh, synthesized and, and focused on, on our pets. Mm-hmm. That's all we have left. We've mm-hmm. destroyed nature. We've destroyed wild animals for the most part. Mm-hmm. All we have left are the domesticated ones around us and the ones we have in our homes. And they've taken on an extraordinary importance for that reason, because without them, we just can't get it done. We cannot face the days that we have without them helping us just breathe easier, just make us laugh. And, you know, when you think about psychotherapy, because with our, our service members, you have cognitive behavioral therapy. There's lots of therapies that they're offered. Psychiatrists, uh, social workers, uh, so a psychologist, you can't bury your face in your psychologist or your psychiatrist. With a dog, you just get down and you bury your face in them or your cat or whatever. You know, might, you might have a rat. I don't know. They're, all of these animals are perfectly capable of wonderful relationships Absolutely. with us. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I, it's the fur and the warmth and the smell and the, you know, and they make us laugh. Every, all of those things release oxytocin naturally in us. Well, so I, why wouldn't you do it? Well, exactly. And not only that, it helps save some of these dogs who otherwise will be put to sleep. So let me encourage you all to go look at the rescue circles and make a contribution yes. to the Warrior Canine Connection, warriorcanineconnection.org. We are out of time. Thank you so much for being with us, Meg, and uh, your work is just beautiful.